Um, and before we continue with uh, a panel discussion, we bring up all the speakers to the stage. Uh, I would like to present uh, some ideas on what actually is available for you today. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to the discussion where we look into you know, the future, uh, what will probably be happening. But um, you also have some, some sort of cloud solutions that are available today uh, for you as clinicians. So if we can bring up the presentation, please. So I will be talking about Austel Connect. Um, and how it sort of bridges uh, the way you accumulate data inside your clinics, basically using the hostile devices, uh, measuring ISQ values, and then uh, sorting out that piece of data. Um, so the word really is connect, and how you sort of connect not only to what has been shown this morning, objectivity, so meaning that you take objective decisions as to choosing the right immediate loading protocol, uh, to choose either one or two stage treatments, whatever you're taking decisions regarding the patient, you're doing it based on objective values. Uh, then of course, we need to discuss within the team. I'm a prosthodontist myself, I place a few implants, but usually I have to rely on surgeons that places the implants for me. Uh, so I need to connect to them as well, knowing what actually is going on with my patients. And also, I think uh, what is important to mention is how do you actually do connect to the patient? How do you communicate with your patients? What's going on? Uh, how do you sort of let them know what steps are involved in the implant treatment? So how do you sort of display that to the patient in, in an easy way? Uh, and also, maybe, how do you connect to the world? Basically, uh, looking at your own data comparing to another clinician's data if that is interesting, what can we learn from, from each other? So, Austel Connect and the discussion we have today, I mean, in dentistry in general, is all about what we call connectivity. So, we, we mentioned this word a lot, uh, and this is the platform where we actually accumulate data from, from the Austel devices. But I see a little bit of problems uh, in terms of, you know, big data in dentistry. Uh, and I have been involved in some projects, for example, with KPIs from, from chart systems. And I feel that, you know, it's, uh, the development is definitely there, but it's very slow. It's a very slow adoption. I think this could be a nice discussion, actually, for, for the panel uh, later on, because we, we have a lot of fancy tools out there. We bring, they are brought to the market. Uh, but when we actually look at clinicians, it's fairly unstructured. Uh, especially when we look at clinical records. There are hundreds and hundreds of chart systems on the market where you generate an enormous amount of data surrounding your patients, small personal notes surrounding your patients. Might even be that you put your ISQ values inside the chart system or on a piece of paper. And how do we extrapolate that amount of data that is out there? Uh, and we talk about, you know, Connectivity, we talk about you know, the workflows, digital workflows, as Dr. Neugebauer showed. But sometimes I also see a lack of communication between these different data silos. So uh, do we actually share information? And of course, oral health perceived as separate from the general health. That's also a problem because uh, government-based charge systems don't, doesn't communicate with private ones. And then, for example, in Sweden, where I'm based, no systems that are based from general health issues uh, and medical doctors are actually communicating with private dental chart systems. So the information is not homogenic. So that's a problem. And of course, then we look at ISQ. You take one ISQ number. It's one moment in time. What's mentioned by the speakers this morning is very important. You look at it as a dynamic sort of process. So we have to measure ISQ over time, because you might have a number 52 over here. That might mean, as Dr. Pianfru said, you might have to submerge the implant, and then you remeasure again. So you have a second value. But you have to have put these values into perspective, all the other surrounding factors with your patients. What type of you know, medical factors do you have? Age of the patient, gender of the patient, the experience, what type of implants you have, diameter, length. There are so many confounding factors that actually affect what's going on with your patients. So where do you put all these? Usually inside your chart system, right? Uh, 
But what is Austel Connect? Well, it's a cloud-based platform where basically you can extrapolate all these you know, pieces of information on your patients at you know, one platform. Basically, you see everything at one place. So that means that you can gather all these numbers and basically accumulate them and collect them into one and the same platform. And that is really what Austel Connect is about. So it bridges the gap between the devices, which of course today, either through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, communicates the numbers and automatically transfers them to your login on the platform. So again, you can see the data surrounding your patient immediately. And then Austel Connect has also grown over the last few years. So you can look at your own personal information, but there's also a global database available there. You can track your own numbers, basically seeing your patients in your clinic. You can export the data, you can consult with patients, basically build up a treatment timeline, displaying to the patient and communicating with the patient. You can discuss with colleagues, you have, of course then have clinical guidance, and you have something that helps you in terms of treatment decision when you plan your cases. So basically it looks like this. So this is part of a profile. And here I can look at my clinic, my patients, and I can add a new patient. But basically the setup here is if I would have this in my clinic, then my assistants would basically set up the patient before we actually start treating the patient. And hidden inside here are a number of things that actually will help us. So if you take one number and the second number, again, it's automatically transferred into the patient chart. You can actually scan QR code barcode for your implant components. Automatically get them inside the cloud-based platform. And I know that still today, 2024, we see clinicians having these stickers, right? You pull them off, you peel them off, and you put it on a piece of paper, which I find pretty funny because QR codes and barcodes have been on the implant packages for years, but we don't use them. Why don't we scan the components inside to a cloud-based platform, which makes it so much easier? And of course, here I can look at my own data. So showing my success, my average healing time, my implant patients. Is this for my own benefit? Or is it to communicate to the world, to you, or to the patient? And of course, being objective is very important. I was very early on involved in different guided surgery protocols. We really tried to push the envelope in terms of what we were able to do with digital protocols. We actually prefabricated final abutments before we even extracted the tooth. And that can be quite expensive if you don't have the right primary stability, or in this case, ISQ value. Because I said to the company, I have no idea what's going on. I'm extracting a tooth, yes, I'm trying to choose the right patient, I have a sense of that I might have you know, enough primary stability. But when you're drilling through a guide, what happens? You lose perception. Because there's a squeeze fit between components, so you lose the perception compared to freehand. So how much of a stability do I actually have? Well, for me, it means that what was said very eloquently this morning, if I have above 70, yes, I would trust that. I could go for immediate loading protocol and then I could load uh, the patient and the implant. So that's the cutoff in terms of being objective. If I wouldn't have that value, I would have to put a healing abutment on top of it. But the problem we had here is that we actually prefabricated all the components. So now I spent all the money on the left-hand side, but what if this value is low? What do I do with that? Keep that one for later? Or what happens with that? So maybe we're running a little bit too fast at that point in time. But we gradually learned. Of course, we saw that, OK, we could pick the right patient. We know for sure that if I have a patient like this, a periodontally compromised tooth, yes, we are engaging a lot of bone beyond the apex of the root. So I might have a sensation that, yeah, I would get enough primary stability. But reading through a guide again, do we actually get what we were supposed to get? So the idea of doing this, of course, is to have an abutment that shapes the soft tissue basically from the time of surgery and not replacing it. And the more I've, I've you know, 
treated implant patients as a prosthodont, I have to say, the less I actually interfere with this situation, the better. The more I try to add, subtract acrylic, polish, try to sort of change the emergence profile, sometimes it becomes even increasingly more difficult. So if I could do this and calculate everything beforehand, knowing that I actually would have that ice cube number and go for immediate loading, for sure I would choose that type of material, that type of design. But then again, what's the right design? Who's generating the design? <laughs> Is it AI? Is it someone inside the implant company, the planning center, or is it me? Who's determining what's the right angle between prosthesis, abutment, crown, right? So very interesting discussion, this previous speaker here. But we learned a lot for these uh, patients, and we had very nice results, pretty long follow-up on these cases as well. But I have to be honest, it's, it's stretching the borders uh, as to when you know, have to be objective. Then, of course, we have patients with risk factors. How do we treat those patients? Of course, we look at an, an enormous amount of studies. And as mentioned this morning, more than 1,400 studies have been published on ISQ. It is by far the most objective data we have in terms of determining when to do certain things with our implant patients. For an immediate loading protocol, even if we spend a lot of effort into fancy softwares, combined CBCT, intraoral scanning, everything that we need to do in order to plan the case in a perfect way. Still, you know, we can play around with different types of implants, but what happens when I actually place these implants? Can I actually calculate what ISQ numbers I will have based on only the CBCT data? Or does the Radiolucency here, Hounsfield units, they differ between different CBCT softwares. So is it true, is it not true? I would still say that, you know, yes, we can, we can look at you know, the bone, we can look at bone density. It all affects the primary stability. Of course, thread design, surgical protocol, we can change the way we drill. But in the end, again, I will lose the perception when I start using these modern tools. I'm drilling through the guide, do I really know what I get? And by far, uh, the most objective choice here is to use ISQ. So, of course, I measure. I would prefer to have, at least in the 70s, if I was supposed to load this immediately, at least in the most distal areas. There are some studies indicating that you need at least above 65. If I have one of these in the middle, I feel perfectly fine because I can splint the implants together in a rigid reconstruction. And we prefer to use fiber-reinforced frameworks. So we take impressions, we don't only print them, we reinforce them with fibers so it's really strong and we can link them cross arch. And of course then it becomes predictable and we can sort of utilize this in more patients knowing that okay, this is what we need to do. And of course then we collect the data so we can bring it up to the cloud, to our Ostel Connect platform. And again, here we can connect to the team. So if I have a certain patient, I can review those, whatever patients are active, when did I place the implant, when is it supposed to be restored, and if you're the person that is not restoring the implant, maybe you want to send this information. Either you're talking to the patient, showing and displaying this. Why do we load a certain, uh, in a certain point in time? Why do we don't load the implant? And then, of course, if we're sending the patient back, to re the referring dentist, or generating an automated report to the patient, basically displaying all the important information surrounding the implant treatment. So there are a number of ways of utilizing Ostel Connect. You can even utilize it for a consultation tool, basically building up the different stages of the implant treatment. So whatever you're doing with the patient, my assistant can basically let the patient know, talk to the patient, communicate in a very intuitive and easy way, and just set up the entire timeline, basically, and extrapolate that. Again, creating an automated report. So this is basically what's going on with your teeth, your mouth, at the moment. These are the different steps. And I know that many of you that are clinicians, 
you try to sell a patient, yeah, we need 12 weeks of healing, we need these, this amount of healing, and still, whatever you say in the beginning of the treatment, they always forget in the end. You told me I was supposed to get my teeth sooner. And here's a bulletproof thing, because this is printed out, you can send it through email, so it's, it's a perfect report that you can use to communicate again to the patient. And of course, if we all bring up our data, we can actually create really cool insights. Maybe the system will be able to tell what is the proper time to restore the teeth. Maybe we can look at specific implants, brands, lengths, widths, to estimate if you choose a certain type of implant, that will be the estimated healing time. What implant is best in a certain situation? And maybe what's the best loading protocol for that type of patient? So we actually avoid the risk of having failures. And this is the amount of data that we have today. So it's almost 500,000 implant measurements, 250,000 patients, more than 300,000 implants, and more than 10,000 peers around the globe inside this system. That's an enormous amount of data. And I think that this really puts individualized patient care into perspective with all these thousands of studies also uh, proving the concept of ISQ and OSTEL. So maybe the things that can be connected will be connected. And I think that that might be actually an interesting start for, for the discussion with the panel. Uh, and with that, I would like to close this discussion. And again, just to remind you that you're all able to send questions during the panel discussion. Just use this event code, go to slido.com, and you will enter and uh, you can ask questions. And of course, I have prepared a whole battery of questions. So now I'm sort of a little eager to pick your brains. So I would like to welcome all the speakers up on stage. We're going to bring up some tables and some chairs. So we'll just give that a couple of minutes so they can arrange this, and then we'll continue with the discussion. Thank you.